Welcome to Intergenerational Politics with Jill Weinbanks and Victor Shearer. We host weekly political discussions with experts around the country that are engaging and relevant to all generations. I'm Victor Shearer. I'll be an incoming freshman next year at UCLA. I'm also the proud co-host of this podcast with Jill. And I'm Jill Weinbanks, the author of The Watergate Girl, based on my experiences as the only woman on the trial team for the Watergate case, um, and now a, an MSNBC contributor and host of this uh, podcast. Today, um, as election day is rapidly approaching, um, we are talking more about voting. We've done a series of episodes uh, surrounding the importance of voting in this particular election and how we can get turnout increased among all demographics from youth voters like Victor to seniors like me. But today we'll be discussing the importance of the Latinx vote and how to mobilize them to turn out in the final home stretch of this campaign cycle. We are joined today by Maria Teresa Kumar, who co-founded a national nonprofit organization called Voto Latino, which uses media and technology to encourage participation from younger generations of Latinx voters. Maria Teresa is also a frequent MSNBC contributor where I've had the privilege of meeting her in the green room. Thank you so much for being with us today, Maria Teresa. Thanks for having me. Of course. So um, I want to begin by having you help us and our audience understand the Latino voting bloc. Um, you know, often in times in politics, uh, voting groups are treated as these monolithic blocks with uniform voting tendencies. So just to get started, is the Latino community a monolithic group or is it an actually, you know, really extreme, complex and diverse voting cohort? They're humans, right? We're humans, so we're absolutely diverse and complex cohorts. <laughs> and as a result, we have to figure out how to how we have conversations that meet the Latino community where they are. And what we are finding that is very specific, it is has everything to do with what region of the country you're in. And what I mean by that, uh, at Voto Latino, we have now officially registered over a half a million voters in time for this election. Uh, and we are going to mobilize 3.7 million voters. To give you an idea, we were going to register, uh, we registered 200,000 in 2008, so 2018. So we have seen a huge growth and it's because there's a different appetite in the Latino community that they feel specifically under this president that is very much depending on the region of the country you're in. So uh, what I like to ensure, you know, tell people is that in the Latino community, you see these waves of change coming that started really in Colorado under Obama, then you saw Nevada fall, then you saw Virginia fall. You see now Arizona coming to be and possibly even for the first time, either Georgia or Texas. And that is because you have a cohort of young Latinos aging into a population under individuals that are caustic to the Latino community. So you have the Jan Bros and the Sheriff Arpaios, you had the Sharon Angles, you had the Train Kratos, and sadly now you have the Greg Abbotts in, in, in Texas. And that is politicizing them as much as Donald Trump. Because while Donald Trump has these horrendous policies that impact Latinos from Washington, DC, in the Latino community in Texas, for example, you walk out the door and there's an onslaught of a reminder that you have a different color of skin and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think something I think that we should all understand and I think remember is that, you know, in 2016, 28% of Latinos voted for Donald Trump and, you know, a lot of his message in this campaign, at least, um, which really hasn't been true is just to, you know, cast Joe Biden under the socialist light in order to motivate, you know, Cuban Americans who fled Castro and fear socialism to vote for him. Um, but then, you know, like you said, um, Joe Biden's campaign is trying to highlight how cruel, you know, Donald Trump's asylum and immigration policies are and to really focus on the disparate impacts of COVID on Latinos and communities of color. So, you know, where we are right now in the state of the race, we have a little bit less than two weeks left. What's the effectiveness of these different messages from both campaigns in terms of the current state of Latino support? The biggest challenge right now, I think, for the campaigns in general is that you've had to learn how to campaign without doing your your photo ops and the going into the communities and holding the babies and hugging, you know, hugging the veterans. And that is a challenge when you don't have as high name ID as perhaps the person uh, before you, like Hillary Clinton or even, you know, Trump. And so it's really, you're starting to see right now Biden going into Florida this weekend and you're, you're going to see Julian Castro hitting Nevada, Texas, Colorado, and Arizona, not by accident. These are all states that are in play. And one of the things that we're looking very cleanly at, 
uh, clearly at is how much connection are they going to do specifically around the health and the wealth of the Latino community. Uh, you mentioned it, under COVID, sadly, Latinos have been the hardest hit of any community, uh, and not just in COVID cases, but mortality. And we're talking about a community that lives in intergenerational households where a mom has to make that decision as an essential worker to leave her home, have her child try to figure out how to navigate uh, distance learning, and then come back and possibly infect the older, the you know, the the older grandparent. It's it's all very real and very raw, and we haven't really heard uh, from none of the campaigns really talking about this reality that sometimes a voter just wants to be seen. And if they can speak to that experience, then it allows them to hear the policy being uh, behind it. And I think that what Biden has done a very good job of is talk about policy, but we need to make sure that there's also that empathy that he's also so well known for in connecting with the Latino community. So as a follow-up to that, in terms of the diversity, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it depended on what region of the country the voter mm -hmm. lived in. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm wondering if it also has to do with the country of origin. Is there a difference in how to reach out the vote for Cuban Americans, for Mexican Americans, for, for whatever country? You know, it's really interesting. It, the country of origin becomes that more specific when you're talking about Florida. Uh, Florida is a whole different kit and caboodle. And the reason I say this is that there are 16 million Americans that happen to be Latino, 11 million among us who are undocumented, uh, whether we are Latino, Asian, or coming from African countries. Though disproportionately, when you hear undocumented, you immediately think it's Latino. So there's 11 million of us that are of mixed uh, of you know that are that may be undocumented. 16 million Americans who live in mixed status families, but the moment that the other 60 million Latinos that are, you know, that are in this country walk out the door with the exception of Florida, no one differentiates us if we're documented or not. So we walk out the door with the same level of anxiety as many of our undocumented brothers and sisters. And it was interesting, what else, you know, we did a poll and we found that the top three issues mobilizing Latinos this election is healthcare under COVID, jobs under COVID. And for the very first time, the racial inequities that exist in Black and Latino communities. Mm -hmm. We've never seen that. And it's because it has everything to do with the protests that occurred right after George Floyd. George Floyd was a tragic death, but it was a catalyst for a long time and coming conversation in the Latino community of what we face, sadly, when it comes to policing and the brutality that is faced. And so uh, for the very first time, we're actually trying, we're finding language and finding also this uh, ability to create different alliances within the, the black brown coalitions that we didn't see before. And it was because for a long time, having these conversations of being racially profiled by police was very taboo. And this is where it gets mm -hmm. complex. 68% of Latinos really value the police. They deeply believe that there's a role for them. But conversely, 63% of us are deeply afraid of the police. Wow. And it and it has everything to do, uh, with, and this has been more high. And this was this was true under President Obama, but it is heightened now under Donald Trump. Voto Latino, we were part of the 21st Century Policing Task Force that Obama put together right after the death of Eric Gardner, trying to get into changing the culture of policing. And with Donald Trump, sadly, that was one of the first things that he zeroed out that community project. Uh, not shockingly enough. And so as we get into this election, that's what I was saying is that for Joe Biden to have this moment of empathy and meeting the Latino community where we are, it, it's all of a sudden being seen and heard from this really, you know, the last four years, the moment that Donald Trump was elected, the level of anxiety that ran through communities of color and immigrant communities has not been quantified in an appropriate way that there was real fear. I gave a talk uh, to 3,700 mental health professionals last year in Dallas, Texas. They serve uh, high schools uh, and uh, elementary schools. So basically they serve kids from pre-K to high school. And the number one issue in the Latino community among parents for health was mental health among their children. I assumed that it was more on the high school end. It turned out that the anxiety and depression showing up among three-year-olds was through the roof. And this is before we got into the pandemic. Oh my gosh, that is... Shocking. It's painful. It's yeah. and it's it's painful and it's shocking. And it, but it speaks to the the real 
the real prejudice and anxiety that the moment the Latino someone walks out is is shown because he's also given agency to people that are just not good actors that basically decide that they can also be jerks, right? So it is a whole slew of things. And so this election, I think for so many immigrant communities and for Latinos that the idea of electing another four years is just not sustainable on so many fronts, not just for our democracy and the world order, like let's park that aside, just for everyday living, right? So it's like, Man, that that is, I mean, we could talk about this for the whole time of our talk, but mm. let's let's go back mm. to focusing a little bit more about whether the messages are the mm. appropriate messages. Um, you know, I mean, you have, as Victor summarized it, you have uh, President, Vice President Biden mm -hmm. trying to focus on the cruelty of family separation, of not denying asylum, of keeping asylum seekers out of the country, um, and mm -hmm. all the other things that are happening, the non-support of uh, dreamers. And is that an effective message to get to the 28% who voted for Donald Trump? Or is I, there a better yeah. message? No, I think, I mean, I will share with you, I think that the folks that voted for Donald Trump are very much, uh, you would say, pro-life. Uh, and I think if you talk to them about how it's not pro-life to lose 553, 400, 545 children yes. and make them orphans, that is not pro-life. Uh, stripping a woman from their, their reproductive uh, organs under ICE detention centers, that is not pro-life. And the, that part of the list goes on. But you also have a good portion of them that they say, well, it's the economics. Well, let's talk about the economics. Under Trump, sadly, you've had, under COVID, you've had 50% of Latinos lose either their job or seen their, their wages reduced. Under Donald Trump, because of the CARES Act, 20% of Latino workers were excluded from it, even if they were US citizens, simply because they had an undocumented loved one in their household. If you want to go after what the undocumented loved ones do is that they are essential workers right now and they pay $27 billion more than Donald Trump does in their taxes. If you want to keep going down the list, you can go ahead and just say at the very basic level, you oftentimes hear him say that if he, he decides that, he, that if he is reelected, he's going to eliminate the payroll tax. Well, the payroll tax, if you're a small business owner, which many Latinos are, sounds nice except when you explain to them that the payroll tax is what funds Social Security and Medicare. For most immigrant communities, Social Security is most folks' retirement plan. Medicare yeah. is their health care plan. There is no supplemental income once most people retire, even if they're business owners. And so it's really breaking down and meeting people at this level very much on their religious beliefs. I mean, the Pope has denounced Donald Trump yeah. uh, all around family separation, saying that it is cruel and verges on sociopathic. This is the Pope. Right? Um, right. This is the same Pope that will not stand next to Pom our Secretary of State Pompeo because he says that it is a photo op that is meaningless. And so if you're looking for religious guidance, I'd encourage you to all look at the Pope as, as, that, yes. as that person versus the President of the United and, States. And the Pope so, who just uh, uh, authorized or approved of civil unions, which I know is not the same as marriage, and I, I don't want to get into that issue, but I mean, he's a quite progressive person. He in, believes in science. He yeah. believes in climate change. He believes yeah. that even if a woman has an abortion, that that is between her and God. They, I mean, he's, he is, I will share with you in the Latino community, he is the Pope that with the values that most of us, we were raised in, in the, they are aligned with the social, the, the, the values of social justice. And he's the first Pope that actually spoke to the religious beliefs of Catholicism that millions of Latinos are raised with, of you speaking and standing up for the most marginalized and speaking to the, and, and not denying, and I, you know, I, I joke about it, but not denying science. I mean, that is, that is not small. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, what's at stake? If you talk to young people, what's at stake? It's like, I don't have to convince young people that climate change is real. I just need you guys all to vote so that you can actually help save the planet at a very basic level. Uh, cultural change is really hard. I get that for older voters. Young people are there when it comes to most of these issues. But what we need them to understand is that their apathy by not showing up is actually handing it over the planet's direction to a man that has no right serving. Uh, and we need them to 
you know, every there's, I deeply believe there's not going to be any of us right now, whether we are, you know, 75 or we are, you know, 18 years old or in between when someone asks us, where were we 10 years from now? And they, we're not going to be able to look at their eye and say, we sat it out at the most important election of our lifetime, because no one's going to forgive that. I hope everyone listening is taking heed of that and will I'm wearing a Jill's pin today that says vote. It. <laughs> and it is the most important. And my necklace also says vote. Oh, that I was, love that. <laughs> Channeling Michelle Obama. <laughs> it was, I was inspired by Michelle Obama when I saw her uh, speaking, wearing a vote necklace. I had to have one. But I, it is the most important thing. And mm -hmm. it is a binary choice. Yeah. Either Donald Trump or Joe Biden mm -hmm. is going to be the president of the United States mm -hmm. in 2021. Mm -hmm. And you may not love either of them, but you love one of them better. One of them is worse and you must vote, make a choice and get out there and vote. So in that connection, what is the best way, the most effective thing that can be done to mobilize the Latinx voters? The biggest thing that we're doing is talking to each other and having our allies talk to each other, right? I mean, sadly in the last two election cycles, 49% of registered Latinos never got a call from the campaign or from a candidate. And that's often because we are new voters. We don't have a history of voting. For the first time, one in 10 voters are gonna be naturalized citizens. 40% of eligible Latino voters are under the age of 33. Wow. Campaigns normally only call folks that have who, who have voted five times. We don't we don't have a chance at that point, right? Like we're all new voters. <laughs> it's just like, and, and this is the thing I have to tell you, you know, like after, you know, after this election, we in the Democratic Party, we they really have to realize that their biggest shot of a majority is cultivating Latino voters and cultivating young voters. Mm -hmm. For the first time, they're going to be 12 million more young voters than older voters, and they're not being persuaded right now. This is a slam dunk. I, I was like, you know, it's kind of like telling Nike, "Don't go into a new market." Like, why wouldn't I? <laughs> like, this is the new market. They have to really figure that out. For young voters in particular, like we talked about this before we started this podcast, but also during this podcast, like what will it take to mobilize us? Because every single campaign, there's always so much talk from campaigns and you know, we have to reach them. We have to get them to turn out. But, you know, you mentioned how in this election, it, apparently young voter turnout isn't as high as 2018. Like what will it take, I guess, beyond this election to really mobilize all young voters? I think we have to remind young voters that when they went out and voted in 2018, they made history. And they don't get it like they don't and it's and and again i would say that the democratic party has been so overwhelmed that they haven't communicated what young voters did in 2018 generation x y and z and i was finally able to jill actually recognize my generation because no one ever talks about z <laughs> but generation x y and z outvoted any other generation for the first time as a cohort oh and collectively with you know with women we we brought in the most diverse Congress in our nation's history, the most women, the most LGBTQ, the most veterans, the most Latina, the most Muslim Americans, the most Native Americans. And when people tell you why diversity matters, I say because we have 400 pieces of legislation now that prove our values. We believed that we needed to safeguard our elections. We believed that we should have climate change legislation. We believed that a woman should be able to, to earn the same as a man. We believed that the person, that there should be a pathway to citizenship. And we believed in gun reform and we, the list goes on. So when people say, well, my vote didn't matter. It's like, no, 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 no. Not only did it matter, it was historic because it brought us that much closer to our aspiration of what our country looks like. And I need you all to go and finish that job <laughs> desperately because we have 400 pieces of legislation now sitting at the feet of Mitch McConnell because that 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 chamber does not look like us. Yeah. That's the most important thing you've said is that it's not just who wins the presidency, mm -hmm. it's who controls the House and who controls the Senate. That's because right. all of that wonderful legislation mm -hmm. is passed by the House Mm -hmm. And it has not gotten even so much as a hearing. Well, and if you care about police reform, I mean, you know, George Floyd tragically died. Within three weeks, they had passed something, right? I mean, yeah. it, it, you, we, yeah. we have an act of Congress that is listening, that is hearing the, the forces of protest and mobilization and doing their job. Uh, it is when we set it out, everybody's like, you know, they're like, well, it doesn't work. I said, it, it, 
only works if you call your your Congress the next day, right? You you have to make just like we made a date today to be here today. We have to make a date with democracy and our democracy right now needs so much love from us and needs attention and needs nurturing. And when we nurture it, it does really amazing things. I like what we saw passed by, uh, by Congress headed up by Speaker Pelosi and the squad and everybody else. And it's neat because it's not all perfect legislation, but it gets us that much closer, but it's, it's the power of conversation and negotiation and, I deeply believe if you see what we have passed, they are a blueprint for the future. Yes. And it's a matter of how do, we, how do we finish it? So anyone listening today, you know what you have to do. Make a plan and go out and vote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for and sure. vote early. <laughs> yes. I've already voted. I, yes. I voted on the first day that um, was allowed in my community. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel very good about it. Mm-hmm. And I hope everybody else will get out and vote. And keep in mind all the issues that affect you. And mm-hmm. I hope that both parties will pay more attention to your community mm-hmm. because you are the largest voting population and will soon definitely be the largest. Mm-hmm. So it's you deserve a lot of attention and your diversity needs to be recognized. And we need to reach out to people on both sides of the liberal conservative divide in the Latinx community. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's conversations, right? Because if we don't, I'll share with you, I had, we did a a media tour yesterday and I called a a radio station in Pennsylvania and we just started talking about politics. It turns out that no one had called them. This is radio. (laughs) I was like, what do you mean no one had called you? Like, this is Pennsylvania. (laughs) It feels like you're in play. Like, why has no one called you? You know, it's like, so we, we take things for granted, but sometimes it's just right in front of us and we just have to, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of hand wringing right now happening with what's going to happen. It's like, well, this is actually what the Democrats and the progressive movements do really well, uh, mobilize. That's what we need to do. Uh, it's not rocket science in this case. We just need to talk to each other and give people a reason that they're seen so that they can, they can do the best thing for themselves. Yeah. And just to close off this, this uh, discussion, um, you know, there's been so much talk about just how to mobilize, mobilize these people, you know, they have to feel um, heard, they have to feel understood and included. Um, and I thought, you know, Bernie Sanders was one of the, were, you know, he was a politician who really mobilized the Latino voting bloc. Um, and, you know, when he dropped out, there was some hesitancy from um, that voting demographic to support Joe Biden. But I think that's what Joe Biden did afterwards, you know, forming these unity task forces, making sure that they are heard. So I guess, you know, there's been a lot of talk about this election, but beyond this election, election and, um, you know, the next administration, what will they have to do in order to um, make Latinos feel heard and understood once they're in office? So, yeah. So, you know, the the biggest thing about Bernie Sanders is the person that was doing his outreach was our male guy for nine years, right? So he got it right because he, we recognize that young people in the Latino community are navigating America for their families simply because they speak English, right? They're first generation. And so they have an outsized role in their families and Bernie tapped that. And when we're going to see when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are in the White House, if we could recognize the lessons we learned under COVID, the real racial disparities that exist in Black and Latino and immigrant houses, that we need to put the country back together so that there is a real middle class, a thriving middle class. What made America thrive in the 20th century was that after the Great Depression, after World War I, we rolled up our sleeves and decided that we were going to nation build for ourselves. We decided to, we were going to make cross-country infrastructure. We decided that we were going to provide home equity lines, not for everyone, but for a group of people so that they could be in the middle class. We decided that we were going to provide GI bills for higher education and real public schools. Those were choices. Our right now is our choice right now is are we going to do the exact same thing for a country that looks incredibly diverse from 100 years, but that is ready on the verge of thinking just audaciously as we did before. And what I love to say is that, you know, we need that America where there's a man one day that rolled out of bed, looked up in the moon and said, we're going to the moon. And with, you know, less technology than our cell phones today, we did it. That's audacious thinking. We need to harness that audacious thinking because we are limitless when we put our minds to it. And we have to be bold because our issues are deep. And if we are not bold, we won't see the light of the 21st century and we won't lead. And I have to say with, share with you that 
we, I've been fortunate enough to travel the world. And I can share with you as a woman of color, having been naturalized in America, there's no other country that I would have loved more or have been so accepted to define myself than this country. And that is worth fighting for. It's true for all Americans. We all came from somewhere else ultimately. Mm -hmm. And our it, it may not have been my parents, but it was my grandparents who came mm -hmm. here. And that is what makes America rich. And someday we should have a long conversation about the value of diversity and what it means to mm -hmm. both gender and ethnic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be an interesting conversation to have with you. So yeah. hopefully you'll come back and talk to this us again. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> this is fun. Thank you so fun. much for this. Yeah, no, Victor and Jill, it's, this is great so that you guys are having this with conversation. Us. It was a real pleasure. Be well, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you. Bye.